You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resensinski and I, Niels Kasselarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. For those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to give you as much of the nurture and encouragement as the turtles got back in the 1980s, as Jerry puts it. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your appetite to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Jerry, where we took an unexpected journey down memory lane to discuss how the landscape of investors in trend following has evolved during the last three decades, which may surprise some of you. So I invite you to listen to this if you missed it. Mark, always great to be back with you. How are things where you are in the Northeast? Good. You know, we're in the middle of summer, so the town is a little sleepy uh, that I'm in because I think a lot of people are out at their summer homes and such, but things are going well. But there are a lot of activity in the market, so there's enough to keep you in a chair and keep your head scratching on what to do next. <laughs> Indeed. We've got a great lineup of questions from James, Frank, Mark, John, and Frederick, as well as some other topics that you brought along. But before we dive into those. I wanted to do my market wrap as usual. But actually, before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge and give a shout out to those of you who left the rating and review this week. As you know, we so appreciate this. And in particular, there was one very touching one that I wanted to share with you. It comes from the United Kingdom, someone who calls himself Baz Dog. Um, so I'm not entirely sure your first name. But anyway, you wrote very kindly I have been an avid listener for over a year and nothing comes close to the clarity and enlightening discussion on this podcast. I subscribe and listen to many other podcasts, including Jesse Fell, The Real Vision, up to and many others, but you rank way ahead in how you understand and more importantly, communicate your ideas and willingness to take questions across a spectrum of novice and semi-pro questions. Long may that continue. Now, I appreciate that. Of course, it's not, it's a team effort here. We all try to chip in with that, but I do appreciate this. And this certainly helps us get motivated to continue this journey. And of course, if uh, anyone else would like to uh, rate and review the uh, podcast, then please head over to iTunes and do that. Now, I know Mark just said that there's enough going on in the markets to keep you busy. But for me, when I was looking at something to kind of talk about, in my little market wrap, I felt it was a pretty uneventful week, unless, of course, you are Danish and follow the Tour de France, or if you are Richard Branson, I think both had a pretty interesting week. But in terms of interesting news, perhaps something that, at least from a historical observation point of view, I know, Mark, you are into that as well. This is uh, what I found. On Wednesday, which was a pretty routine kind of 40 basis point decline in the S&P, we did see something of historical footnote because on that day, we had a whopping 429 members of the S&P finishing lower on the day, making it the smallest decline with that many red components since at least 1996. This was according to a Bloomberg story that I picked up. In other words, the rally is held up by very few names, it seems. Another kind of fun fact I picked up this week is that the S&P 500 valuations at the end of June this year has beaten out March 2000 for sky-high valuations based on book value since 1927. In terms of market actions that did stand out, I guess you could say that grains found their footing, moved up in aver on average, I would say 8 to 12 percent for some of the grains. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we saw lumber. I think it was down almost 30%. So yeah, there was a little bit of action. Of course, finally, we had an uptick in inflation. But since Jerome Powell doesn't think that we should worry about it, we're not going to worry about it today on this episode, at least for now. Just want to bring you in, Mark, just to uh, see what has caught kind of from a 
30,000 foot point of view, but I caught your intentions, attention, I should say, since we were last on a few weeks ago before we dive into the specifics. Well, I think the point you made about the equally weighted S&P 500 versus cap weighted is very important to watch. And I always am amused when I start to hear more than one person start quoting similar statistics. So it's almost as if, well, they either heard it in the news or they're watching similar characteristics of the market. But it is scary the fact that the equally weighted S&P 500 is showing different, such different performance than the cap weighted. And so if you think that we should have a broad-based recovery right now in the economy, you should expect more of the components of the S&P doing better. So, so that's something to watch for a lot of investors. Yeah, no, absolutely. There are some really interesting statistics happening at, at, at the moment. In terms of a trend following update from our side, as I mentioned before, it was a pretty mixed bag this week. On our side, grains and soft were really the sectors that did well for us, but they were all that was all being offset by losses in energy, equities, maybe with the exception of Hang Seng and Spy, they did okay. And the currency sector also suffered losses. The largest gain this week came from lean hogs and the largest loss came from crude oil. And they were both completely identical, about 25 basis points. So nothing much to write home about. Fixed income sector on our side was marginally positive, And that was mainly driven by things like short sterling and also the Australian bonds uh, did okay for us. The trend barometer, fun fact here as well, Mark, actually, on my own trend barometer, it finished the week at an unchanged level from last week, uh, which was 34, which is a weak reading. But it's actually also exactly the same reading as last time you were on. Right. And I think it tells <laughs> us a little bit in terms of the lack of action uh, in the past few weeks, or at least every time we're on, uh, it seems like it's uh, just kind of the same environment we are in. Now, another few interesting things, I think, when we look at the volatility space, the realized volatility of the S&P dropped from already low levels, I think it was around 10 the previous week, and it reached a low point of 5% annualized volatility on Thursday before rising a bit on Friday. Interestingly, a lot of the action over the last few weeks has taken place in the final hours of every Friday. The VIX index has kind of stubbornly hovered around 16, 17 level and actually had a day this week where there were no change at all, which is quite rare and has only happened 24 times since 2004 before it rose to 18.44 on Friday, again, showing a little bit of sensitivity or heightened sensitivity to even small changes in the S&P. The VIX term structure steepened quite a bit during the week before flattening out again on Friday. And as usual, most of the action took place in the shorter maturities and the longer dated volatility remains pretty unchanged. On our side, all of that action in the volatility space meant that we had a completely flat week unchanged, I think within five basis points or so. For my own trend following model, which as you know, I can be a little bit more detailed about. It was a down week, but it's still up 47, 46 basis points for the month of uh, July. It's up 13.48% for the uh, for the year 2021. Performance so far this month, when we break it down to the group models, group one classical trend down about 52 basis points. Group two models, uh, which have a long bias, it's down about 35 basis points. And group three models, which are sort of more fast reacting models, they're up 1.33%. So that's where the performance is coming from. In terms of sector attributions, the top three are actually just top two because there are only two profitable sectors so far. This month, it's the bonds and it's the base metals. And the worst sectors this month are short-term interest rates, energy and equities. Drilling down further into the markets, German Bund US 10-year notes are the first two or the best two in the months to date. And then on a tied third place, we have the SPY and the NASDAQ so far. And at the bottom this month, we have the DAX, short sterling and Japanese yen. In terms of trading activity this week, the week started out with the model getting out of short DAX position for one of the fast reacting models and then going long DAX for one of the classical trend models. On Tuesday and Wednesday, there were no trades at all. And then on Thursday, the system got stopped out of a long short sterling position and took a bit of a loss there. 
And then yesterday, again, there were no trades. In terms of the risk level in the portfolio, the risk to stop, meaning if everything got stopped out on Monday, it should lose 7.93%, uh, which is certainly at the lower end and down from 11.57% the week before. So stops clearly have moved somewhat closer to the current prices. As I said, pretty quiet week with less than five trades for the whole week. So, Mark, we've got lots of questions and I think we should just dive into those first and then go to your topics afterwards, unless you have something that you're burning with right now you want to bring on. No, we can move on to questions, but I will sort of say that after listening to your recap, which you know talks about a fairly calm market, I, I shake my head and say, when will I ever learn? I, I was completely captivated by reading testimony from Chairman Powell, reading what's going on with the ECB, spending all my time reading and trying to analyze you know the latest news. And in reality, if you were trend following your pure price-based systems guy, you sort of say, it was sort of a boring week, not much going on, no trades, not a lot of volatility. And so so it, when I sort of started out and said, like, well, it was very busy, I said, I seemed like I was doing a lot of work, but well, there was uh, but there's very little to show for it when you look at what's happening in the actual markets. I actually think you bring up a good point there, uh, which is really relevant for most people. And that is, I think we all get kind of swept by news flow and we relate that to activity and, and 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 things we should be doing. But as we both know, and I think most people listening to us today know that actually what we've come to learn and, and accept is that most of the best things we can do is to sit on our hands. And when there are lots of trends around, that's pretty much what we do because there are very few signals to, to take. And this probably will also go to part of the uh, one of the questions I remember that came in. So let's deal with that in a bit more detail when we come. First question I want to bring up is from James. James writes, thanks so much for your emails and the podcast. They are great every week. I was reading about divergence between price and momentum indicators in one of Kaufman's and that's Perry Kaufman's books just now and thought it would be a good idea to hear your uh, guys' views on it. Kaufman outlines a few different ways to trade divergence between price and whatever momentum indicator one chooses. Some involve entering your trade in anticipation of a price move, others after the price has begun moving following a divergent, e.g. like an MACD or a stochastic crossover. He also notes that divergence is programmable, so one could use it in a systematic way. What do you guys think about this and trading momentum in general? Ever tried it, tested it, or used it as a pre-qualification or confirmation indicator, or would you consider it a total different strategy from your existing price breakout or moving average crossover approaches? I make the assumption, perhaps incorrectly, that a rising price is bought once price reaches the end day breakout, you know, or high, even if momentum is slowing, which could be a sign price is about to reverse. I guess there are three practical implications of my question on divergence of momentum with price. One, entering a long position when a rising price continues to increase but at a slower rate in anticipation of a decline. Entering a new position in, ant in anticipation of a crossover or breakout so you get into the trade earlier. Obviously, this is a bit risky. Or three, using momentum for confirmation. You only take your breakout or crossover trade if your current momentum indicator is aligned in the same direction as the price movement. If there is, if they are divergent, you don't take the trade. You could interchange momentum with volatility with a volatility metric, which is where the two models would differ, but the same principle of divergence could apply. Thanks again to you and your team of traders. It's so great you guys take the time to do this. Thanks. James, thanks so much for this question. It's a really interesting one. Mark, I'm just going to start by sending it over to you to hear your thoughts on this. That's a very complex question, and I'd love to be able to give him one word, like a yes or no. But of course, we live in a world of, of maybes. It's important to realize, what are you doing with momentum? And in some senses, that I think he alludes it to, in part of his question, that it's a it's a conditioning factor. So you could think of the first thing that you do when you look at it, you have a large set of prices from a large set of markets. And your first condition is, 
are prices above or below a trend, right? So, so that's your first condition. And then you think about your second condition, maybe momentum. And so in some sense that I'm looking for price trend with rising momentum. So that's a second condition. And now the question you have to ask is that, well, what happens to the number of trades that you actually have when you place on that second condition? So by definition, you know you're going to have fewer trades. So you're going to reduce the number of trades that you're actually going to undertake. The question comes in is that, is the quality of the signal conditional on that second factor, which is momentum, is it going to be offset the fact that you're going to have fewer trades? So that means that your success rate has to be higher to offset the the fewer number of trades. And the quality of the trade or the P&L that's generated from that trade also has to be higher. So And the reason why I'm spending uh, first this sort of discussion is that when you always, uh, you can always condition on more and more factors in a trend following model. And you could usually get an increase in the probability of success looking at past data. But that doesn't mean that it's a good model because it could be that you cut out so many trades that then you don't really have a portfolio of activity. So a perfect for example is let's say that you, you have a trend following system that over a, a, a one year produces 10 trades. And you said, I'm going to have a number of other conditions that I'm going to have, and now I'm going to have two trades. And those two trades are correct. So which one is better? Is it better to have a system of 10 trades over the year or two cr- trades that are always correct? That It may not be that just having a, a complete success is going to be better because the profitability might be less, one, and you may not have those conditions appear in the future for years. So you may not have any trades whatsoever in your portfolio. So I think that the first thing that when you start thinking about momentum or any condition is to say, what does it do to the number of trades? What does it do to the uh, probability of success? What does it do to the P&L? That being said, I think that what you find is is that you know, using sort of like a MACD, using different factors, and, and I know Perry Kaufman pretty well. We, we did some work together year, years ago. He's done an exhaustive work to show the efficacy of different momentum strategies. So so he's very good about showing the numbers. But that being said, I guess I'd sort of say that I've looked at it, I've sort of watched it, but at the same time, I can't sort of say that has always worked well in terms of actually adding more return per unit of risk in a a long-term system over many markets. Yes. No, I I mean, first of all, I think you, you hit the, the nail on the head by saying that one of the key challenges is that we we will reduce our sample size if we if we start putting on too many conditions. And I think this is what Moritz spoke to a couple of weeks ago in terms of him reaching peak complexity at a younger age and then since then kind of backtracking and trying to making it as simple as possible. I think Jerry has been through kind of the same and of course, he would definitely always favor, I think both would always favor a large sample size. I find myself sometimes a little bit in in the middle, meaning that I know that my systems has probably a little bit more than just a 40-day breakout as a condition. It There's a little bit more to it than that. But I agree with the concept that we, we should not try and overcomplicate systems. Now, Incidentally, just before Mark and I hit record today, I was saying to Mark, I picked up this tweet on Twitter from Trader Steve. I think the Twitter handle is UK Trend Follower, Trend Following or something like that. Anyways, he writes some great stuff on Trend Following, of course. And one of the recent articles he put out was about having, you know, extra conditions. And, and I think he used an example where he talked about if the volatility is too high at a point of entry, his system would not take the trade. Now, can work sometimes, but it can also basically leave, lead you to miss some trends because the volatility might be high at the point of entry, but it could die down, but never reverse. And then you're just out of that trade. And then that continues to go on and, and become a great trade. So 
I mean, again, it's down to your personal preference. It's down to your test and the results and what you believe in. And funnily enough, I think to a large extent, when you look at the whole spectrum of trend followers out there where we can follow public records, of course, of their uh, performance, I think we all do things a little bit differently. We, we do. But in terms of the very long-term returns, I mean, that it's not that they are vastly different, really. So I think sometimes maybe uh, we come across as saying, oh, there's only one way of doing trend following. But I, I don't really think that is the case. I think there are a few different ways of doing trend following. But I do think that there are some core principles we shouldn't change. And one of them, of course, is to introduce unnecessary com complexity into the model. Right. Overfitting is always a problem for any yeah. model model maker. And and I think that the perfect example is that when you see there have been a lot of trends that I've seen where all of a sudden you sort of you reach some you know MACD or some other momentum indicator that it, it gets to a high and a trend keeps on going. And if you're sort of a slave to sort of slowing momentum, then you have a problem is is that you're usually going to get out of a, a lot of trades early. And, you know, we'll sort of say that a perfect example is this is that one thing that it always instilled with me with my time with John Henry is he says that trends always last longer than expected. Now, it's hard to sometimes monitor or measure that. But, you know, so many times people say, well, that the oil market is overdone. And then it, it, it goes even further higher or all oh, the crane, grains can't go any higher. And lo and behold, then they hit it, you know, higher numbers. And the perfect example, even in the last year, is that you could go commodity by commodity. And if you went back in the first quarter and you'd sort of say, for example, this is that corn market can't get any higher and it's up over like 30% and then it gets over 50%, more than 50%. Same with soybeans. They say coffee, you look at crude oil. So what we do know that in general is, is that trends will last longer than what our mental picture often describes a trend should be. And what momentum conditioning will usually get you out of those trends that may last longer than you anticipate. Yeah, and just picking up on that, Mark, I think the last year has also taught, reminded us of a couple of things. One is, of course, we saw price action in crude oil that nobody had ever, I think, imagined that crude oil could go negative. So, you know, we, we shouldn't try and, and, and be too high, you know, restricted in our imagination in terms of what markets can do. And the second thing I, I would say is that actually this period, say the last 18 months or so, it's really been the simple trend following models where there is definitely no filtering and anything like that that has done the best. So I think this is uh, really important. And the other thing that I was reminded of when you were talking was that a lot. I see a lot of people, not necessarily trend followers, but just on sort of technical traders and all of that, they talk about, you know, RSI, oh, it's overbought, right? And then when they realize, oh, shoot, the market continues and it just keeps going up and I'm out. Then they start talking about divergence, right? And, you know, yeah. So we should, I think, I mean, this is why I kind of really like just looking at price and, and not overcomplicating things. But I think it was a great question. Yeah. And, and when you think about it, even when you talk about stop losses, now, in some sense, that's a slowing of momentum. So, so you have to be, so, so the slowing of momentum comes in many forms and in many measures. And implicitly, you may have a slowing momentum factor in your model, but you may not call it that. So, so for example, if if you, you look at a corn market, corn market's going up, you know, fifty percent over the last year or more. Now, within that, you might have had a such situation that, well, I've got a stop loss that's going to get me out ten percent beyond what whatever the current level. So, if I reach a high and then it, and then if it re reverses by ten percent, I'm going to get out. In some sense, that's a slowing of momentum. It's not a reversal of the trend. It may be just, again, a reversal of some of that and, and give back a price. It's not by definition a reversal of momentum or slowing momentum, but implicitly that's what it is capturing. It's capturing, you know, a slowing of momentum and a reversal trend 
or even when you sort of say that I'm going to scale by volatility. That's a, that's another way. It's a conditional factor, but it, it, in some senses, that's a slowing of momentum because if price, if volatility is higher relative to the trend, then by definition, that's a slowing of momentum. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's move on to a question that came in from uh, Frank. And Frank writes, I'm a long-time listener to the show. I cannot say no to thank you, Jerry, Moritz, and even Rob, more recently for the mindset to embrace trend following. My question is related to last week's episode with Jerry. I think it's implied that when you talked about different look-back entries, there are different look-back exits and ATR stops. Is it fair to say half term, half the entry time frame, meaning I think what he's talking about here is if you're using, you know, say a 30 day high, you're using a 50 day, 15 day low, but in, in this terms, in, in uh, ATR terms, and he writes, uh, i.e. three ATRs for 100 days, six ATRs for 250 days, or consistency in ATRs on all time frames is more beneficial. Now, I don't, uh, this is obviously more a Morris and Jerry kind of uh, methodology, but I know you know everything there is to know, uh, Mark. So maybe you have a view on on the relationship between the stop and sensitivity to the look back period. Right. Well, this is an ongoing problem that not just for any trend follower, but for even for any quant in particular, the problem comes in this is that if you want to look at volatility or you want to look at a look back period is that you want to try to get the maximum amount of sample you can have. So I need more data because then I I, my, I get a more efficient estimate. But the more data I have, and if let's say I'm especially looking at any data on an equally weighted basis, then the more that I'm putting emphasis on what happened in the more distant past as opposed to the more recent past. So, so there, statisticians have come up with a number of measures of volatility that uses the open, high, low, close in an effort to sort of say that I can close my sample. I could look, have a, a shorter look back period, but then I use more of the information that I have intraday to be able to come up with an efficient uh, measure of volatility. And in some sense, when you think about, you know, ATR is a way in which you're trying to get more information than what you could with just a standard deviation. So I think it's important to realize this is that a lot of the problems that people grapple with are key statistical issues of sampling of how much information you use. And in general, is this is that looking at ADR looking at a different Parkinson measure of volatility or uh, other measures is, is trying to sort of deal with the sample issue. Isn't it actually, we spoke about Perry Kaufman earlier, uh, isn't it from one of his books where he writes something like loose pants fits all? I'm pretty sure of that when it's when he talked about stops and, and why you might want to give it uh, a little bit more leeway. Right. And, and so, so I think that look back period is one of the key when you think about where are the key variables that you're looking at to try to you know, customize your model to make it personalized. It's how you use look back and how you use sampling is one of the key, key areas. And it's often overlooked. Everyone wants to sort of say, I want to look at a specific indicator. When in reality is, is that a lot of times signals are going to be generated by the, by the uh, size of your look back period, that the differential between one model and another is a matter of look back. And so I think it's oftentimes underemphasized relative to saying I'm going to add other forms of complexity. People don't think of look back as a complexity issue, but in reality it is. Sure. All right, we're going to move on to some uh, question about, I guess you could say risk in general. This question is from John. John writes, I want to thank you and Jerry for answering my question on episode 148. So that was last week's episode. Excellent show. I have another question for you and your next guest, which is you, Mark. Risk management is one of the most important keys to becoming a successful trader. The 2% risk per trade rule has been popular for years with Jerry Parker and the Turtles using it with much success. In the industry today, is the 2% rule still the most popular? I know some traders will risk 5% or more per trade, and some will risk less than 1% per trade. What are some of 
so what are some instances where you would want to uh, risk more or less than 2% per trade? And what are the ranges of percentages of risk per trade you commonly see in the industry and for your funds? And this is from John. Now, John, uh, let me jump in here first. The 2% rule, you may have picked that up from a book about the turtles. And there's no doubt we talked a little bit with Jerry about that uh, last week that they were obviously producing some enormous uh, returns back in the 80s, taking a lot more risk than what he's doing today. So I think if you if Jerry was on the show today, he would say, oh, I don't risk more than, you know, 25, 30, 35 basis points per trade. It's certainly not 2 percent. And 5 percent is an extraordinary high level of risk to take because you only need to take 20 trades in a row and you're out of business. So so th- those numbers you're quoting, I think they're uh, much higher, certainly than what we would even consider in the quote-unquote sort of professional space of the industry. Individual traders, of course, may well take higher risks, of course, because they might feel comfortable with the higher level of volatility that would come with. But I think I think you could say that a lot of managers probably today are somewhere between 25 to 50 basis points risk per market, but it could even be spread out over a few trades and entries. It certainly doesn't have to be in, in, in one single go. That would be my best guess. Now, you asked a little bit, when should you take more, when you should take less? Again, going back, if you had if you asked Jerry and Moritz, you, they would probably say to take the same every time. But I also got into a discussion not long ago with Moritz about, no, maybe, well, maybe with Jerry, where because I do use in my model a, a variance, or at least there could be a difference in risk-taking depending on how well that particular model is working with a market. A little bit like what Jerry, uh, sorry, not Jerry, Perry Kaufman is doing. He's selecting markets based on success. I'm not, I, I want to trade all the markets, but I do allow the model to increase its position size based on historical profitability over a certain period of time. And I don't see anything wrong with that, but I'm sure some of my co-hosts here might shake their head and say, no, you can't do that. But, you know, you can. But again, you don't want to lose sample size too much for sure and don't do anything too crazy. But this has worked well in my case, at least. Mark, you have some thoughts? Well, again, it's just taking a very high level approach that you have to break up what you do as a manager into two parts. One is signal generation, and the second is portfolio construction. And, you know, you could say a third part is risk management. I'll say that portfolio construction and risk management are tied together. And we'll sort of say that most people think that all the effort should be spent on, you know, on the signal generation. And in reality, this is that the people who last longest in this industry, the people who have the most staying power, they, they have good models, but it's not so that they have a secret sauce that no one else knows on the signal generation. It's probably on the portfolio construction, the risk management, we'll call it portfolio craftsmanship, is makes all the difference in your staying power. And I think that what uh, I probably use more variable positions because you want to have a, a, a certain level of confidence, but then I also sort of look at some, some other factors beyond price. If you're looking at just a price-based system, this is that it's hard to beat some equally weighted approach. You will say risk-weighted approach across your positions because it's hard to say that one market is going to do better than another. And it's hard to say at different times that, okay, given this signal is going to be that much stronger than the next signal so that I should increase the size. So I played with variables, variation in, in sizing of positions. I think it adds some value, but in general, as this is that I think that there's a lot of efficacy with the idea of taking equally rated positions, which would which probably where Jerry comes out. Yeah, absolutely. And of course you could say, but I, it's kind of a mute point, but you could say that even a purely price-based system with different look back periods does have variable position size because they're not all going to go to full size. Some of them will go to half size and 25% of the size. So there is something, it's just the way we think about it might be a little bit different and how we express it in our models. But it's not, I mean, if you only had one entry and it's either full size or nothing, right? I mean, sure, but actually none of us does that. So 
So there is a little bit of a difference in how we get to our full position and what constitutes a full position, of course. And I think that you make a really good point in the sense is, is that you may say I have equal positions in the same size for a model. But if, I, if my system has multiple models, then I'm going to have variable positions based on the aggregation of my models. For example, a perfect example is that I might use multiple models. And in some senses, that what you're doing is that you're sort of averaging the, this set of signals across multiple models. And when you do that average, you're going to get variable position sizes. So you could have equally weighted for any given model. But as you aggregate more models, you're going to get a different size position. Not unless you sort of say, I'm going to aggregate all the models, and then I'm only going to look at what the net, and then I'm going to trade, you know, always keep the size the uh, same at any given time. But generally, you're going to have variable positions because you have multiple models. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks so much for that question. The next question is from Mark. So not our Mark, but another Mark. And this was kind of following a little bit of an email exchange I had with Mark. And I thought actually it was a good topic just to bring up on the podcast as well. And so Mark wrote, if your systems would have you short 30-year rates, so i.e. it's going to be long the bonds, and they were already neg at negative rates when you got the signal, would you take that trade without reservations? What if your system initiated to short oil and it had already gone negative? I'm wondering if you or your hosts would ever just not take a trade because it seems absurdly absurd logically. And if not, then why have an opinion on anything and why even read or study anything outside trend following system design? if you will never act on it. I'm trying to mentally prepare myself to take that signal if rates go negative. It seems to be a great trend follower. You really have to abandon other investment religions like value investing. And so Mark and I had a little bit of a back and forth about this. And of course, um, I told him that it has nothing to do in, in, you know, if you're fully trend following, it doesn't really matter where the price is relative to where it's been before. You just have to follow the rules. I know what you're saying. I mean, I understand what you're saying. And mentally, it can be difficult to take some of these signals. And I think we certainly also on, on our side at Don will say to many of our clients over the 47 years that we've been in business, we've certainly taken many signals that looked completely absurd when you got into the trade. And I guess one of them would be when you look at rates where people for many years said, oh, you can't be long bonds anymore because they're so low in terms of yield. And of course, that bond trade just kept going for a long period of time. I don't think any of the trend followers got short in oil when it was already negative. They would have been short a long way before that happened. But it's a good example. I mean, you will get situation where it just seems incredibly illogical to take the trade, but you have to do it. And I think also, I can't remember, but I think my other answer to, to you, Mark, was that you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen, you lose 25 basis points, maybe you lose 50 basis points. It's not a big deal. You just, it's better to have a mindset where you know and feel comfortable about always taking every signal than trying to do anything else. But as Mark said earlier on in our conversation, which you allude to here, is, uh, and that is true, if you decide to go all in on trend following, you don't need to spend time reading up on the news. You really don't. You you can, and some people find it interesting. I find it interesting uh, to follow along, but it has no impact on what I'm going to do as a trend follower, and neither should it have for you, Mark. But anyways, back to our Mark. What are your <laughs> thoughts on Mark's comments? It, it is, we'll sort of say when I was studying ec economics is that they used to you know sort of talk about negative interest rates as a trick question so because that would be out of the mindset of most people what does it mean to have a negative rate okay and now we've actually had a decade of negative rate plus a decade plus of negative rates in Europe 
And in some sense, part of being a systematic trend-based model builder is say that anything can happen and anything is within the realm of possibilities. And as they get older, you can sort of say, like, I've actually seen everything that could possibly happen outside the realm of possibilities. So is it is it something you should avoid? Well, as as you just uh, st- stated, is that at worst you're going to you're going to lose whatever the risk that you put into the trade. Okay, but we'll sort of say the unexpected always happens, or in the Monty Python, always <laughs> expect the Spanish Inquisition and the unexpected. <laughs> yeah, no, very true, very true indeed. I think the next question, which also came actually after an email exchange with Frederick. It's kind of along the same lines a little bit because it was it's a question that we often get, which is why maybe trend following is not as 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 fully embraced as it should be, in our opinion, of course. And Frederick writes, the discussion about why investors are not really embracing CTAs is very interesting. I noted the comments made in the very last episode with Jerry, so that's the last week's episode. Based on my experience of working in investment banks, sales, and trading for over 25 years, I would see the reason as slightly different than what has come up so far. In my view, it has a bit more behavioral, it's a bit more behavioral in the sense that most investors will consider themselves quote unquote experts, rightly or wrongly, in one or several markets and will not want to give away this expertise to a rules based system. So they are very reluctant to give that power of decision away, even when proven wrong. I have great examples and stories in the fixed income markets with traders and investors fighting strong trends and unable to ever accept that a trend following system would quote unquote, know better than they did. Kind regards, Frederick. And I replied to Frederick at the time, I write, I fully, I agree with you. It certainly relates to our behavioral biases. And as you say, our challenge to quote unquote, give up our expertise to follow rules. Now, if only people could see that their expertise is what comes out in the research of these rules, so it is being put to good use, that would go a long way. Interestingly enough, we often talk about trend following as a total package, but in reality, there are two very important uh, components. One, wanting to identify and capture trends as an investment strategy, the other being a systematic trader. I think the latter is sometimes forgotten. Uh, in all of this. So that was my response uh, to Frederick on that. I would love to hear your thoughts as well, of course, Mark. Right. I think that one of the interesting studies that was done was on model anxiety. So so they actually studied this is that, that someone has is giving a, a model-based approach to some forecast and then a subjective forecast, a discretionary forecast. And let's say the model that is more accurate but when people find out that it's uh, driven by a model, that it's a rules-based system, they actually increase the anxiety and their willingness to choose that that approach actually goes down, even though it does better. So we have anxiety, you know, we'll call it behavioral anxiety, with constraining ourselves to a set of rules. And I think that's one of the toughest parts for a lot of people with following trend following models is that you're constraining yourself. They're always asking about, well, what if this happens? What if this other condition happens? And and a model will say, no, you just follow the rules. Second, you can sort of say this is that it's much harder to show that you're smart in a Wall Street sense if you're an analyst, if you're following a model because the model says, okay, this is my trade. Here are the factors that I use in my model. I can describe the model, but there's nothing more. There's no narrative associated with it. And most people like to have that narrative of when, and they feel comfort in narrative. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of the same kind of, we, we, again, and just using kind of uh, Don as, a, as an example of this, there are many others, of course. But if you think about the fact that we have 47 years of actual track record, and if you were to, at the beginning of all of that, had to always speculate, as you say, what if, instead of just saying, well, actually, over the last 47 years, there's been so many unexpected events. We've had everything from war to climate crisis to, you know, what, whatever it might be. As you say, negative interest rates, negative oil prices, you know, financial crisis, bubbles, this, that, and the other. Yet a rules-based approach 
has actually dealt with all of that in a pretty solid way. Uh, yet it is this innate wish for us and, and for our investors to always try and find something that could go wrong. It, it, it is very difficult. And this is why it is so difficult, I would say, to fully embrace and trust a rules-based approach. Right. And in fact, you know, when I mentioned before the study, the actual research is called algorithm aversion. And what they find also is that people will use, they'll use imperfect algorithms. They'll use an algorithm if they feel that they have some sense of control or they can at least modify it. So, but I think that that they want to have that they as a person still is in control, not the model itself. But people should look up this idea of algorithm aversion or, or actually read about it because it's a very interesting topic in behavioral economics. It's not behavioral economics, in behavioral psychology that hasn't been explored enough, especially from a trend follower's perspective. Sure. Another thing that hasn't been explored enough is your own topics for today. So let's begin on that, Mark. As usual, I'm going to uh, give the listeners kind of the short headline that I got from you and then I'm going to be very excited to see where you're going to go with this. So the first topic that came up is sober reality of recovery, the calculus of business cycles. Right. I do look at a lot of the fundamental information and, you know, follow follow a lot of the real data and, and are always trying to look for, you know, quantitative signals that can be uh, ascertained from the data. But I think that this is important. You say it's been a slow week, but this has been an important week, month, for a period of, of change in the macro economy. And we may not see it until September or later, but we're in a period of change. And the way I view this is that we've had the reflation change. And now we're at a period what we call, some have been referring to as peak growth. And peak growth is this, is that our momentum or our acceleration of GDP has probably reached its peak. And in some sense, I think that this is very uh, analogous to trend followers. When you look at fundamental data, there's level, there's trend, and then there's acceleration. And what we're seeing in the United States economy is that there's a slowing of acceleration. We still have a positive trend, a positive velocity, but we're, but we're having a slower acceleration, and that's going to start to show up in market be, market behavior. So the easy money has been already gained because we had uh, a reflation, we had strong acceleration that passed over into stock markets, bond markets, commodity markets. Now we're in and beyond peak growth. So the acceleration has slowed. And so now more localized effects will have an impact on markets. So, so when you think about it, is that the same type of approaches that you can look at as a trend follower can also apply to fundamental data. We already talked about it earlier today. There's trend in price, there's acceleration in price, there's level. And all of those sort of come together to determine, you know, what will be the fundamental factors that impinge price behavior. Yeah, and I, actually, I do think that there are some managers, uh, established managers, that take momentum of the trend into account. Because as we talked about before, we all do things a little bit differently. And I, I certainly feel from all the interviews I've done that momentum or kind of the momentum of the trend itself is something that some people look at and not just absolute price. So I think it is important. The next topic you brought up is called narrative ambiguity versus model clarity. So where are we heading with that one? Right. Well, as I said, is it, uh, you said it was a slow week and I said, well, I was really busy because I was listening to Chairman Powell and, and, and it, Jerry would probably say something is that like, why do you waste even waste your time and <laughs> time? And I sort of said, like, I'm looking for those nuggets. And what you find out that there is no nuggets oftentimes with this because they try to be uh, central bankers try to be ambiguous. And, and this is why this is the exact opposite of a systematic modeler. I think Vincent Reinhold, uh, the economist, uh, sort of mentioned that, that central bankers have a love for ambiguity. And, you know, when you ask them the question about is there transitory inflation, 
they'll tell you a lot of information, but they'll never define what it means to be uh, to, or to have transitory inflation. You know, if they say, well, when are you going to raise rates or when are you going to taper? And they're going to say, well, there's a lot of factors to take into account, but they won't tell you. Now, let's take a look at a systematic manager. He does exactly the opposite. The whole idea of using a model is that you're going to try to have precisions in your decision, precisions in your definition. You have to be, it's, it, things are very clear. If price, in a very simple case, if price is above trend, I act. There is no ambiguity. There is no love of ambiguity from a model builder. In fact, there's a hatred of ambiguity. So if you ask, what are you going to do in this situation? If price is above trend, I'm going to get along. There's no, well, I have to wait and see what happens. I'm going to have to determine what is this environment at a specific time. So if you're in a world of precision with systematic modeling, and then you sort of say, I want to try to not impose, but I want to look for that same clarity from central bankers or from government officials about economic issues, you're going to get exactly the opposite and you're going to be very frustrated. Very true indeed. Let's move on because you had a, quite a few topics. If there's one here you just want to give a short answer to or you want to skip it, just let me know. But then there's another thing which is, is obviously very topical, has been for a while, and that is the continued punitive cost of cash and, and how to fight it. So I'm curious to know uh, what your thoughts are. Well, the reason why I bring this topic up is that, that you know, we're seeing that what has been happening for the you know, last 10 years, whether it's in Europe or the United States, is, is that the government is, uh, central bank has been keeping interest rates low. And part of the idea is, is, is that if you're a consumer, we want you to not hold cash, but you want to spend money, right? So if real rates are negative, if you have inflation, part of the idea of generating inflation is from a consumer's perspective is, is that instead of holding your higher cash balances that are actually going to have a negative return, a real return, is that you go out and spend money it's so that that will actually boost the overall economy. So that is the policy prescription from a, a financial perspective is that, well, by having negative interest rates or negative real rates, and you will have a situation that's going to force people to take risk and go out and invest. And so that should be good for the for the economy. And in reality, that can go on and on, but it, that means that people are taking more and more risk in a situation. And the question is, is there an alternative between this extreme of holding cash and getting a negative real rate of interest or just going out and buying risky assets. And in some senses that you sort of say that you want to break that conundrum or the dichotomy between cash that's giving you a negative return and high risk assets that are often overvalued. So for example, the stock market or the bond market. So between those two extremes, if you sort of say that there is this knot of what you should do, the alternative is to say, Maybe I should ch change how I think about decision making and a style could be approached to offsetting this negative cash and the style could be trend following. What I mean by trend following is to say this is that I'll go out and buy these risky assets, but at the same time as it, before I even enter into the purchase of the risky assets, I have a methodology or a style or a trend that will tell me when I'm going to reverse or get out of that to that risky asset and back into cash. And so you fight negative real rates by developing and using a system as opposed to just buying risky assets. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Mark, actually. And if anyone wants to be reminded of high valuations and risky assets, I think June was the 300-year anniversary for the South Sea bubble. So if you want to read up on that and what happened, that's a good example of Something that looks incredibly similar to what's going on right now in our little world. Now, the next one, interesting one, the power of weather shocks. And I don't know what you want to talk about there. All I can say is, of course, we here in Europe and me being in Denmark at the moment, having driven through uh, Germany to get to Denmark from Switzerland, obviously the news right now, very sad to see 
in, in the western part of uh, Germany with all the flooding and people losing lives and all their belongings. So what stroked me, and I don't know whether this is relative, related to what you said, but what, what have kind of stayed with me when I watched the news was how everyone says it happened so quickly. I mean, people who had been living there for all of their lives, like 60, 70 years, They'd never seen anything like this, and they just said it happened so quickly. So tell me where we're going with this. Well, the, the one thing is that uh, in the U.S. we have similar stories, as I think that uh, we talk about the great drought out on the West Coast, you know, especially in the Central Valley in California. And at the same time, as this is that then I think people thought that, oh, my God, this is that all the corn crop and soybeans crop in the Midwest are going to burn up or we're going to have uh, problems with, uh, you know, crops in down in Latin America before because of drought. But what you find out is this is that I think it's important when you think about modeling and, and markets you choose is that there is a certain amount of unique behavior to each market that adds diversity but also unique risks. A perfect example is that all the grain markets, you know, the commodity markets in general, non-energy, and even the energy is very much affected by weather risk. What we're going to see is natural gas prices are going to go up if we, you know, have, uh, it's probably more summer-related risk as well as winter uh, risk, which we didn't have before. If you look at a chart on corn and soybeans, this is that we'll sort of say that volatility has increased because we're seeing more because We've moved, again, from this business cycle issue. We've gone from the reflation trade more to peak growth. I think that uh, people are believing that inflation might be transitory. So it's not, they've established a lot of their positions. And now what we're seeing is that as, you know, and we'll say that index money has come in, markets become more affected by local effects as opposed to you know, macro effects. And I think that's an important to sort of realize is that corn, Usually hit and soybeans usually hit their highest volatility right now because you're having corn pollination. You're at a key growing part for soybeans. And so what you sort of see is higher volatility that actually affects trades that is very seasonal. Yeah, no, indeed. I guess that co does that cover the next point you made about food and political risks? Well, or the one thing I guess risks? is that, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about weather and weather is a unique seasonal uh, impact on uh, commodities that you may want to take into account for models. I think the one thing that I found that most interesting is that, well, people have talked about, well, we need higher inflation. If you look at, you know, the world food prices, is it that the real food prices based on the FAO of the UN is at the highest level since 1975. So, mm -hmm. so you have a situation that usually when higher real food prices get to these levels, oftentimes that you start to get some geopolitical uncertainty is that people, you know, this is the real effect, the inequality effect of higher inflation. This is that if a higher inflation and real and, and tied with real food prices getting higher, is that you have a situation is that, that could potentially cause more unrest. So you know excesses in prices do have spin-off effects beyond just what it has on, on the budget. You know, consumer budget. So I'm going to jump one question. I might come back to the, the other question, but since you're talking about higher prices, you raised a point about do we need infu inflation futures? So why don't we stick with the, that topic for a little well, while? Well, <laughs> it's only because we're seeing all of the increases in uh, in GDP. And, and you know, if you talk to most investors, they're either going to say it's transitory, it's non-transitory. You know, there's constantly a talk about how long this is going to last. This is something that we probably have not had a lot of exposure to over the last decade. Europe, I think the latest European numbers still show that you're around 2% inflation. This may not be as, as pertinent. And, but we tried, you know, CPI futures or inflation futures back in the 80s. It just sort of failed as a contract. But is it time for a new inflation futures contract? Now we have inflation swaps, they're actually fairly developed, been around for a fairly long time, and you can clear them on, you know, Clearport, you could clear them on an exchange, so you can be able to do this. But for a lot of investors, this is that, you know, if you wanted to have, uh, if you weren't going to do an inflation swap, but you wanted to just trade the uh, a CPI futures, it's not available. 
we don't have futures on the tips market either. Volatility is a lot less than what you'd find in bonds, but at the same time, as that's also been picking up. So I'll just throw that out there. Is, is, that, is there time for a new futures contract associated with inflation? Well, if some of our friends from the CME group is listening in, maybe it's worth uh, considering. I think it would be good to have a place where people can express their opinion on future inflation. We have so many other contracts out there, and uh, I think inflation probably should be pretty high on the list in terms of importance. So why not? Two more points that you raised that you wanted to uh, have a word on, and one of them is curve play and bonds, trading basket of treasury trends as anti-curve. What does all that mean? Great. We've been doing some work with a, um, with a client where he's, they trade you know, curves in the U.S. yield curve, you know, tens, twos, you know, sort of looking at different fives, tens. And so we've been looking at a lot of data on, on that. And we'll sort of say that uh, the curve is, is is not very normally distributed to changes in, in, in yield and the yield curve. Very fat tailed. You can have a lot of big changes over short periods of time. And I take that back for trend followers is that most trend followers don't trade curves as a spread trade. What they do is they look at each portion or point on the yield curve as a separate market. So implicitly, they may be curve traders, but they're not bound to a curve trade. So I could trade two fives, tens, thirties on the U.S. yield curve. I could have my 10-year long and I could have my two-year position could be short. I could actually have a implicit curve play in my trades, although I don't call it. And you're not wedded to one view because if you're in, if you trade all those, you could actually be longs, two fives, tens, and thirties all at the same time, or you could have any number of combination of those trades. So it's interesting that a trend follower who trades multiple points along the yield curve can be a curve trader, albeit. He doesn't think of it as a curve trade, but it ends up as such. Yeah, which is interestingly enough, I mean, Moritz revealed on the last appearance he was on a couple of weeks ago that he had started introducing some spread trading into his system. I don't know much. He didn't give much detail, maybe. And I know that we have a question that came in following that in terms of resources to read up on that. So I'm going to ask Moritz to dig a little bit deeper next next time. But yes, final point that you had was a Hayek coordination problem and recovery. Well, what you know, Mr. Hayek has it's interesting is that if you're a uh, price-based system, a trend follower, then you should be a follower of uh, Hayek in the Austrian School of Economics. And in, in sen- some mm-hmm. senses, it just did a, a thumbnail sketch Hayek said this is that that an economy is a very complex system. It needs a lot of coordination. And the only way that you get this is coordination is through prices. Everyone follows their individual behavior. They follow their individual objectives. But through the price setting mechanism, that's the way we get coordination and their allocation of resources in this complex system. And I think that by that very nature, it sort of says is that a trend follower is saying that markets are a very complex system and the coordination of markets is, again, through prices. Now, how this ties into the business cycle, and I view this as a thought experiment or something that I think that we should focus in on, is, is that if we're hitting peak growth or if we're not having a stronger growth, is it possible that because of distortions in prices in the economy caused by the pandemic or caused by a higher inflation or caused by government manipulation, is that, that is subverting the coordination process that you normally have in an economy and that we may not get as strong of growth as what we expect for the simple reason is that if you have uh, distorted prices and you don't have this coordination effect, then people are going to make and not make as many risky decisions. They're not going to take on as much risk. And we'll sort of say that while the Fed and ECB wants to get higher inflation creates price distortions. And price distortions would mean is, is that there's poor coordination in the economy, and that would probably lo- lead to lower growth. And so in some senses is that, you know, 
monetary policy driven by an, an attempt to uh, manipulate prices and cause them to be artificially high through inflation is actually subverts the coordination of the price system in our economies and could actually be harmful. So it's a big thought, but I think that anybody who follows prices as part of a trend follower should also think about the impact of prices as a coordination in the economy. Sure. Unintended consequences, in, in, I guess, indeed. to call it. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's move on to uh, a little bit of an update as to how the scores are coming in so far this month. The Beta 50 index is down 28 basis points as of Thursday night, up 5.81% to date. I think yesterday was probably a little bit of a down day for CTAs. Stock Gen CT index down 72 basis points, but still up 5.75 for the year. Stock Gen Trend Index down 69 basis points and still up 6.66% for the year. The Short-Term Traders Index down 17 basis points so far in July, up 84 basis points so far in 2021. As I mentioned, my trend barometer came in at 34. That's a weak reading, so in line with what we see in terms of the numbers. And I guess in terms of uh, traditional investments, the MSCI world is so far up 25 basis points for the month, up 12.44 per percent for the year and the world government bond extend index is having a good month so far up 95 basis points next week i am joined by a new co-host richard brennan from down under he's sitting in for rob the next couple of months while he's on holiday so that's going to be super exciting and fun and very educational i'm sure so make sure you send your questions to us the sooner the better of course you can email them to info at toptradersonplug.com and Rich and I will do our best to answer them next weekend. Anything else, final thoughts, uh, Mark, from you before we wrap it up for this week? Well, I'll keep looking at those Powell testimony and we've got the Jackson Hole sort of meetings that's coming in that if you're a monetary policy person, you're always going to follow that pretty closely. But again, I'll I'll read all that information. I'll still be frustrated and sort of say I should always just follow prices, but I will follow the madness of trying to figure out what's going on in the real economy. <laughs> and I agree with you. Uh, Jackson Hole is always interesting to see what comes out, although we will still end up just following our signals. As mentioned earlier, we would so appreciate if those of you who have not le yet left the rating and review would take a few minutes of your time and just go to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the show because there is quite a big difference in terms of how they rank us if we get a continuous stream of rating and reviews. So in advance, thank you so much for doing that. From Mark and me, thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back with you next week. Until then, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.